uh, Saturday afternoons we'll watch this movie. Um, so we made this movie, and we, we we're going to look at how other countries provide health care for everybody and spend half as much. And um, uh, here's the thing. Uh, the two things I want you to watch for. When you make a documentary film, I'm the guy on the screen. But the, the that's called the correspondent. That's what CBS calls the reporter. The, the guy on the screen is the only guy you see, but he's the least important member of the team. Uh, and in fact, the term for the person who's in front of the camera, they call him the talent. And this is a derogatory term, it means mere talent. Uh, the really important people in making a documentary film are the producer who plans everything, but particularly the cameraman, the cinematographer is the official name. And um, the cinematographer on this film was a brilliant artist, Mark Rubley. And here's what happens we show up in some country somewhere to interview some doctor or somebody, and um, the interview is scheduled at 12, and we show up at 9.30, and Mark then spends two hours rearranging the guy's entire office so that it looks good for his interview. And um, you, nobody, I don't, I, I used to say to him, nobody's even going to see it, but if you will please take a look. When I'm interviewing people, in most cases, not everybody, in most cases, behind the guy, it's very interesting. Mark has cast shadows, and he's put things behind the guy, just so the background looks good. Please watch for this. And then uh, the other point is, uh, when I made this movie, uh, looking at uh, healthcare around the world, I was writing a book on the same topic. And uh, the, the key point of my book, the absolutely key point, which I make on the first page and about 100 times more throughout the book, is that a rich, decent, ethical, Democracy has a moral obligation to provide health care for everybody. This is a, this is a moral, uh, ethical obligation of a decent society. And and when you write a book, you can really hit these things with the sledgehammer. Oh, oh, I keep coming back to that. And when we were making the movie, I said to the producer, "So look, I really got a pound this moral obligation to provide health care for everybody." And he said to me. Uh, no, uh, no, we, we kind of do it differently in movies. We do it a little more subtly in film than you might do it in print. So I kept saying to the producer, John, let's, let's, let's get the moral point in here, right? And um, he kept saying, no, we're going we're gonna to kind of tread lightly on that. So here's what I want you to watch. I want you to watch and see if this film makes the moral argument that every uh, decent society should provide health care for everybody, because he never let me say it. And I want you to see if you think the point comes across. Thank you. Frontline is made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. With major funding from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, helping to build a more just world. And additional funding from the Park Foundation, committed to raising public awareness. This report continues on our website, where you can watch the full program again online. Get this, they spend half as much as... Find out more about correspondent T.R. Reed and his reporting of this story. Everybody has the right to healthcare. We have our interviews with some of the world's leading healthcare experts. A four profit system on the one hand and... And learn more about how the U.S. healthcare system compares to those in other countries. And then join the discussion about this program at pbs.org. Okay, so that was a lot to think about. Uh, so, uh, 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 so what we'll do now is we'll take a brief uh, break about 10 minutes or so, and uh, and think about that, that documentary and have some questions when we get back with TRV. So, definitely go grab some refreshments out in the lobby, and we'll be back in a few.
Okay, I guess we're gonna get started here. So, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce T.R. Reed. T.R. Reed has become one of the nation's best-known reporters through his books, articles, documentaries, and reporting for the Washington Post, as well as his commentaries on NPR's Morning Edition. He's, he majored in classics at Princeton University and worked as a naval officer during the Vietnam War. He was a lawyer, a teacher, and assorted other jobs. Also at the Washington Post, he covered Congress in four presidential campaigns. He served as the Paper Bureau's chief in Tokyo and London. And Reed has reported from four dozen countries on five continents. He's covered elections for offices ranging from the Barton County Drain Commissioner to the British Prime Minister. He's written nine books in English and three in Japanese, and he's translated one book from Japanese. And his 2009 book, Healing of America, which you mentioned at the beginning of the documentary that he was talking about, uh, became a national bestseller and has launched Chief Reed into a national role describing ways to provide health coverage for every American. And PBS Frontline made two documentaries with him, including the one we just uh, watched, which was 2008, Sick Around the World. And he also has um, another documentary, uh, India, Second Opinion. And the most recent one, actually, there's the third that came out, U.S. Healthcare and the Good News. And it is my pleasure to introduce, on behalf of PNHP, PHR, ASA, and ACC, T.R. Reed. Very much. Thanks again for coming on a Saturday to uh, watch our movie. That, that's really fun for me. I haven't seen this movie for a while. It's kind of like seeing an old friend, you know, that you haven't seen for a while. Uh, I have really nice memories of that film. When we were making the film, I said, "Gee, we're going to do comparative healthcare. We got to go to Canada. You know, all Americans want to know about Canada, Canadian healthcare." And the producer kind of went on with it. The problem is, Canada looks like America. You know. And he needed exciting visuals. You saw the, the guitar for a while, for all those pictures. And, and uh, so I said, he said, no, you ain't in Canada that boring. You know, what can we do? And I said, well, you know, Taiwan adopted the Canadian system. Taiwan, isn't that in China? He said, you know, that's fabulous. <laughs> so that's what we were, what we were having dinner on with that area in Taiwan. And Taipei is called Snake Alley, because they serve grilled snake there. It was really good. <laughs> and then Bill Chow, Professor William Chow from Harvard, who is fabulous. If you're into health policy, you really need to read uh, Bill Chow's great book, Getting Health Reform Right. Um, came to Taiwan. He was hired to design the Taiwanese system, and he came to Taiwan when we were filming. And a really wonderful thing happened, I thought. We went to this fishing village on the uh, east coast of Taiwan. Ying John, I think it's called Ying John, the characters mean Golden Mountain. The fishing village of maybe 40, 50,000 people. And uh, this is an old, old town, but it, it had never had a hospital. And under the, uh, the new system that Bill Shaw described, well, uh, designed for them, part of what he wanted was he wanted a lot of small hospitals scattered around the country. And so they built a hospital in this town for the first time in history and had a group of doctors. And we went to that hospital with Professor Shao. And there was a woman in the lobby, um, just, just not a doctor, nurse, just, just a local woman. And she was just sitting at a table and taking patients' blood pressure. When they came in to go to the hospital, she would take their blood pressure and write it down. And I went over to her and said, what are you doing here? Do you work for the hospital? She said, no, nah, I'm just doing this as a volunteer. I'm just trying to help out. Why? She said, well, I owe a lot to this hospital. Well, what happened? Well, so um, in the 1980s, her mother got breast cancer and died of it because there was no doctor in King John. You, you got breast cancer. They didn't treat it. Maybe you got better. Maybe you died. Her mother died when she was eight or nine years old. And lo and behold, um, 25 years later, when she was 30 or 33, she got breast cancer. But by then, there was a hospital and a doctor in her town, and she went and had it diagnosed and had it treated, and she's a survivor. She's doing fine. So she feels grateful to this hospital for saving her life, and her daughter's life will be saved if it happens to her. And so she comes in three days a week to volunteer to help out, which I thought was quite nice. So I said to her, well, you know, um, right over there, 
that, that gentleman right over there in the white shirt, that's Professor William Chow, and he designed the healthcare system that saved your life. And she said, oh, she felt an obligation to go over and thank him. So this is, to me, so Asian. So here's what she did. This woman walks very quietly and deferentially, walks over to Bill Chow, and um, Bill Chow turns to her, and she turns to him, and they bow. And that's it. That's how she said, thank you for saving my life. Don't you like that? I just, really touching, I thought. And uh, I, of course, then said to the producer, let's get that on film, you know, but they missed it. You can't really do it again. <laughs> Uh, some people do hope these things up and do them again, but it, that's not what documentaries should be. And then you saw Ruth Dreyfus, who was the woman who was the first female president of Switzerland. And I don't know if you noticed, but for a while I was interviewing her in her office with stacks of books, and Mark Rubley, the cinematographer, really didn't like this, and she's a pretty tough person, and she would not let him move the books and <laughs> set up the pretty background like she, he likes. So um, we were filming, and right in the middle of the interview, Mark Rubley's the photographer, stopped. He says, no, this is just too ugly. I can't do this. <laughs> so he says to the president of Switzerland, uh, Here's a, would you mind if we interviewed you walking around Lake Geneva instead? And she said, oh, that's OK. So uh, as you notice, we would spend a lot of energy walking on the shores of Lake Geneva. Um, and they're in the middle of Lake Geneva, right near uh, the city of Geneva, there's a big fountain that shoots up waves like the Washington Monument. It shoots up 500 feet out of the middle of the lake. And uh, Mark kept, it shoots up every 40 minutes, and Mark kept saying, slow down, you know, slow down. <laughs> and then it did go off, but he didn't get, I wasn't saying anything interesting, so we didn't <laughs> kind of nice to see that. Um, Really nice for me to be in Rochester, Minnesota, I think, for anybody who's interested in health policy and interested in doing something about our health care system. It's thrilling. It's exciting to come to Rochester, Minnesota, because what you guys are doing here at Mayo's is a model for what the United States ought to be doing. I think everybody recognizes this. It's, it's, it's just fun to come to this town, this, this big town built around concept of good health care at reasonable cost. That's what Rochester, Minnesota, and the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Medical School was all about. So for, for an outsider from Colorado to come here, this is exciting and great. Um, as Eric said, we, we made a film last year for PBS called U.S. Healthcare, The Good News. It's based on the Dartmouth Atlas studies. I don't know if you know this, but at, at the Dartmouth Institute, they look at, at Healthcare costs in every county in the United States, uh, thousands of counties, and they rate them uh, by quality of care and cost. And there are certain counties in the United States with very good care at way below average cost. And we made a movie uh, for PBS, and we went to six or seven of these uh, communities to see how they do it. And now when we show this film, people always say to me, well, you should have gone to Rochester, Minnesota. Because I don't know if you know this, but your county is one of the lowest cost healthcare counties in the United States, even though you have the most famous clinic in the world right here. Uh, how do you do that? How do you run the Mayo Clinic at reasonable cost? We should have put it in the movie. You only get, if you make a, a, a movie for PBS, you know, it's a one hour show. Here's what happens. Uh, they show the title, and then they stop. You have to stop for 90 seconds at the beginning so that your local station can say, please send money. And, um, and then at the end, they, they, you have to stop early, and so the local station can say, didn't you like that movie? Please send money so we can show more of them. So it, it must happen in Minnesota. It's really what happens in Colorado. So you only get 54 minutes if you make an hour-long movie. And we just ran out of time. We never got here. But uh, I don't know that it's necessary. Everybody in America knows the Mayo Clinic. They they know you're good. They don't. I don't think they know that you're a low cost, uh, below average cost provider as well. But uh, anyway, we should have come. So good for me to be here. Uh, it's I, it's also nice for me to be back in the Midwest. I grew up in Michigan, 
And um, I'm a Midwestern boy. Uh, I know the Great Lakes. When I was a child, I read the wonderful book, Paddle to the Sea. I think you can still buy that book in Minnesota, fabulous book. And I definitely remember, as a young man, as a kid, going to the big house in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on a Saturday afternoon for the Michigan-Minnesota game. Which we almost always won. Uh, I just want to point out last November, uh, Michigan 35, Gophers 13. Uh, good for me to be back here. I've always liked uh, uh, people in Minnesota. Just everybody I've known from Minnesota, I really like. And one Minnesotan in particular I got really was, was great to me in my career. And that was Walter Mondale. The students don't know him, but he was a senator from Minnesota. He was vice president of the United States, ran for president, should have been president. He would have been a good president. And uh, he, I'm so old that I was the, I was a new reporter. I was the most junior reporter at the Washington Post when uh, Jimmy Carter became president and Mondale was his vice president. And the Washington Post is a very politically minded newspaper, so we always cover the new vice president for the first five or six months just to see what you know what she's up to and uh, what he's like. And, and uh, none of the senior reporters at the Washington Post wanted this beat. Oh God, you know, travel around the country with some gas bag politician. He gives the same speech every time, you know. And I was the newest guy, and I'm thinking, gee. Ride Air Force Two around America with the Vice President, not bad, you know, I could do that. So I took this job and I had a wonderful time. I just had a great time traveling with Mondale. He knew, you know, every Democrat in America. And mostly what he did was we would leave Washington on Friday afternoon on the big plane and fly somewhere and he'd do a he'd do a, a fundraising speech at what the Democrats call the Jefferson Jackson dinner. Um, in one place, and we fly to the next state and do a, a fundraising dinner, and all the local Dems would be there, and he knew them all. And he knew that I was a budding political reporter. So he was very, he's just a nice guy, he was very nice about introducing me to all these Democrats. And one time we went to raise money for the Democrats in San Francisco, and he grabbed me and said, look, there's a member of the city council here who's really a, a uh, an up and cover. You really need to meet this person. So he takes me over and says, Tom, I want you to meet Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> and there she was. He spotted her as a future leader. Um, really nice guy. And one time, one, one uh, weekend, we left Washington on Air Force Two and flew, I don't know, Montana, someplace out in the West, uh, for him to give a speech on the Saturday night, the fundraising speech. And then Sunday there was nothing. This was like in February or March, he had been vice president for two months. Um, and, Mon and, and I thought, hey, this is pretty good. I got home a day early. You know, I don't have to do any speech on Sunday. But not Mondale. Mondale is looking at the map and he says, well, I'm flying home from the West Coast to Washington. I'm going to fly right over Minnesota in March. I'm going to go ice fishing. He's in Minnesota. <laughs> so sure enough, they, he told everybody, he called his buddies. And we decided, he decided he was going to go ice fishing somewhere northwest of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, wherever the heck that is, you know. And, uh, and, and the problem was you couldn't land Air Force Two at the little runway in Detroit Lakes. It's too small an airport. And so the plan was we're going to fly to Minneapolis MSP, Minneapolis St. Paul, land Air Force Two, and we're going to get on this fleet of three little Piper Cubs to fly to Detroit Lakes, one for Mondale and his staff, one for the Secret Service, and one for the press. There were about five of us traveling with them. Uh, okay, that's fine. And it's a cold, snowy day uh, in uh, Minnesota in March, you know, and we landed Air Force Two. We got on our fleet of little planes and flew up there. And it, I mean, how far can Detroit Lakes be, you know? And it, it seemed like we were flying forever. I just couldn't quite figure it out. And finally, we figured out we were circling around this little landing strip in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, because it was snowing, and the Secret Service was worried about having the Vice President land under such conditions. It was too dangerous, right? So they're still circling, and we had no idea what was going to happen. And finally, over the radio comes the solution. They've come up with the answer to this problem. They're going to send in the press plane first. 
And if we make it, then he can land a prize machine. And no, I'm not making this up. This is actually happening. Uh, you know, I don't get between a Minnesotan and his ice fishing, I think, is the, uh, is the answer here. Anyway, look, we landed. I'm here. So, so I have really, I'm delighted to be here. Um, after I was a political reporter at the Washington Post, uh, I noticed one of the things I really liked was I liked going out and traveling with the uh, with the candidates or with anybody because you you know you, you get a little bit away from the boss. The problem with working in a newspaper newsroom there's a lot of buzz, there's a lot of camaraderie. Everybody's crammed in. You know, you sit right next to the other guy. You never get very far from your editor. You know, the editor is maybe 15 feet away at all times and. I just don't like being that close to the boss. And it doesn't work that well for me. Uh, they don't like me, I don't like them. And so I, I, I like the job and I like the newspaper, but I kept thinking, how can I get a little further away from the boss? And finally, I came up with a fairly drastic solution. And instead of working 10 feet from the boss, I would work 10,000 miles from the boss. So I became a foreign correspondent and uh, went overseas. And this worked beautifully. I developed a a career plan that has worked very nicely for me. I recommend it to all young people. My basic career idea is never work within eight time zones of the boss. <laughs> this works fine. Uh, and when I was overseas, particularly in uh, Japan and China, uh, if they ever called me, you know, if the editor ever called me, no matter what time of day it was, I would say, God, do you know what time it is here? You know, get them on the defensive, right? <laughs> And the answer is no, they don't know what time it is. Uh, the, the, in the Washington Post newsroom, there are these clocks on the wall, you know, Paris, Moscow, Beijing, Tokyo. It says Tokyo 12. And they don't know whether it's noon or midnight. <laughs> I mean, do you? Does anybody know what time it is in Beijing? I mean, people don't know. That. So even if they called me at noon, I would say, what, do you want to wake up my kids? You know, like that. Get them on the defensive. This is very good. So they left me alone. Uh, it worked fine. As long as you filed your copy, you know, by deadline, and it was reasonably accurate, and they just they didn't bother you. I liked them a lot. So we stayed overseas for 16 years in various countries. And guess what? Uh, my kids got measles. You know, my kids would break a wrist or something. Uh, uh, I fell on my skis at Nose Islands and Ski Resort and broke something. And uh, we started using the healthcare systems in these other countries. And uh, fairly quickly, I think my wife and I began to realize that we were a little trepidatious about this. I mean, we're Americans. We know that America does everything best. You know, that's kind of basic. Um, <laughs> and in many areas, it's true. You know, in many areas of the world, we're number one. Uh, my wife is the daughter of an American physician, and she was pretty wary about going to foreign healthcare systems, and uh, fairly quickly we figured out we were getting very good care in fine facilities, uh, not much waiting, and amazingly the prices were minimal. The price for the same procedure, if your kid had otitis media, you know, a nine-year-old with an earache and she has to get a pencil <coughs> shot, the price is one-fifth of what it would have been in the United States, one-tenth, one-twelfth, one-twentieth. Quite often, when we lived in Japan, I didn't even send in the bill to the insurance company because the postage was more than the doctor bill. You know, it just, it just and, and I just kind of got interested in this. How do they do this? How do you provide decent care for people in decent places, decent facilities, and charge so much less? How do they do this? Just as a reporter, I got interested in that. And then I went around the world to do this reporting and discovered the even more striking fact. Uh, which is, as Eric said, and we said in the film, all the other countries like us, and I mean by that advanced, high-tech, free market, capitalist democracies, there are about 30 of them in the world, all of them provide health care for everybody. All their citizens, all their aliens, legal or illegal, they just cover you if you live there. And yet, on average, they spend half as much as we do. And I just got interested in this topic, how do they do that? And I think, I think it is telling that I first got interested in this when we lived in Japan, because as you saw in the film, Japan really is, a, I think, an incredibly successful healthcare system. They have the longest life expectancy in the world. They live longest of all people in the world before the onset of 
the standard diseases of aging that we kind of think of as hitting you around Medicare age 65, 68. They go to 78 or 80 before they develop rheumatoid arthritis or these other uh, problems. Um, and the Japanese, of course, cover everybody with, with very good care, minimal waiting, and uh, well, at the moment, the United States is spending about $8,100 per person per year on health care. And the Japanese spent 3,800, less than half, and they covered everybody with very good care. Um, and they said in the film, people like going to the doctor in Japan. They're the biggest consumers of health care in the world. Uh, I saw, anybody here lived in Japan? Do you know this country? It, it, as you know, it's, it, it's, this is a hard-working, nose-to-the-grindstone, conscientious, earnest kind of country. They take life seriously. And they have this national broadcaster, their PBS or their BBC is called NHK. And NHK absolutely reflects the population that serves. It's earnest, it's serious. You know? We're not goofing around here on NHK. So if you watch NHK during the day, they start with the news broadcast in the morning. And then they have an economist come on and analyze the news for a while. Then they have a panel to discuss the, the economist conclusions. Then they break for another news show, and then they show a documentary. This is what they do all day, you know, they're serious people. And for some reason, and I never quite figured this out, I'm a reporter, I should know this. For some reason, after midnight on NHK, they let the comedians come on. <laughs> why, why do they do this? I don't know. But um, So if you stay up late, you can see some pretty funny stuff. And one night, about 1 o'clock in the morning, my son and I were watching TV in Tokyo, and here's this skit, and uh, it's three old retired guys, like Yamamoto, Tanaka, and Honda-san, and these three guys are having their morning coffee together, uh, and it becomes obvious that they do this every morning, you know, they're retired, they just get together every morning and have a cup of coffee, uh, you know, pretty standard, and, uh, and then the camera kind of pans back. And we can see that the place where they're having their morning coffee is the doctor's waiting room. <laughs> and it's true, as Dr. Kato said, a lot of seniors in Japan go to the doctor three times a week or five times a week. Uh, the copay is $3.50. You know, why not? It's less than a cup of coffee. And so these guys go to the doctor every morning. They get their coffee from the vending machine in the doctor's waiting room. <laughs> and this, too, is very common because doctors are paid so little there that they all have a, an array of vending machines so that you'll buy some candy or buy something like from them while you're waiting. And, uh, no, this is absolutely standard. So these guys, these three guys are, are sitting there drinking their coffee in the waiting room, and Tanaka says to Yamamoto, he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, where's Watanabe? How come Watanabe-san's not here today? And the answer is, oh, Watanabe's homesick. He couldn't come to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a, that's a health care system that they really like. The Japanese are very satisfied. I don't know if you, anybody will remember a year ago, about a year ago, the opening ceremonies of the Summer Olympics in London. At the opening ceremonies, they had this 45-minute tribute to the National Health Service. Do you remember this with nurses and patients dancing on big hospital beds? Uh, because they really like the National Health Service. And I was sitting there watching this thinking, God, can you imagine at halftime of the Super Bowl having a tribute to the American health care system? <laughs> uh, we wouldn't do it. But other countries like their health care systems, and they cover everybody. And just as a reporter, I got interested in how you do that. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the detail here, but I think, uh, particularly in the book, I think I did figure this out. I mean, it's not a secret. They'll tell you. Um, and what I found was um, basically four models of healthcare delivery. Every country's healthcare system reflects its culture and its history, its values. But um, Fortunately, you don't have to go to all the countries in the world to figure out how they do it, because there, there, there are certain basic models. Uh, I should point out to you, I'm the health policy expert. I'm just a reporter who got interested in this. Uh, many economists would agree with me on the four models. Some economists see six different models. My personal guru, the guy who taught me, Uwe Reinhardt of Princeton, his matrix is 16 different models of healthcare. He goes into more detail. 
And so Uwe would say there are really 17 models of healthcare in the world because the U.S. is different from everybody else. We're not even a model, as the gentleman from Taiwan said. Uh, but I'm a reporter. I'm trying to make this stuff accessible. So I'm going to present you four different models of how healthcare is provided in the world. And we saw them all in the film. Uh, no, we saw three of them in the film. So first of all is uh, the British model that we saw in the film. In this model, um, the government owns the hospital. Uh, doctors who work in the hospital, specialists, surgeons, radiologists, are, are government employees, nurses, lab technicians, everybody in the hospital is a government employee. The, in Britain, the family doctors, like Dr. Badat, the big fat guy we saw, um, they are private. They run their own clinics. They're called surgeries. The doctor's office is called surgery. Uh, but they're only paid by the NHS. The patient never pays. Uh, so uh, the government provides the care, and the government pays for the care uh, in this NHS National Health uh, Service system. Um, and guess what? This works. Uh, it, it's a system that has proven to work quite well. Uh, Britain, for example, as I said in the film, has somewhat better health statistics than we do. They cover everybody. Uh, as I think you know in the United States, at the moment we have 48.6 million people without health insurance. Britain covers everybody, including all their illegal aliens, including me when I was there making the movie. Anybody who's there, they cover. Um, and, uh, and of course, as I said, you never get a bill because it's paid for through taxes. They do pay. They pay a lot. The sales tax in Britain on everything you buy is 20%. Include food. I mean, the taxes are high. But it nets out, since you're paying no premium, no copay, no deductible, people end up paying less for health care than they would in, than they do in the United States. And yet they cover everybody. So this is a system that works pretty well. And therefore, it's been copied broadly. This national health service system is used in Spain and Italy. Most of Scandinavia, New Zealand, Cuba is a famous case of government-run national health service kind of health care. The government provides the care, and the government pays for the care. So here, let me ask you a quiz question. You, you saw the film, you saw the British system. Would you call that socialized medicine? What do you think? Is that socialized medicine? Yeah, I'd say yes. I'd say yes, that's socialized medicine. I don't think, I, I give a lot of talks in America. Was ask people about socialized medicine. And basically, Americans don't know what it is. We don't know what socialized medicine means. We know it's bad. We just don't know what it really is. Um, but I think if government provides the care and government pays for the care, to me, I call that socialized medicine. And guess what? They cover everybody at reasonable cost with pretty good quality. Uh, so I, I'd say it works. But, but, this is important. I don't want you to think that the only way to cover everybody is through some big government, government-run socialized system. Because as you saw in Germany, Switzerland, Japan, and many other countries, these are private systems. Uh, the German system invented by Bismarck, the Bismarck model of healthcare, is private doctors, private hospitals, and private insurance plans. Um, I argue in my book, I'm, this is absolutely true, that um, many of these Bismarck countries are less socialized than the United States when it comes to health care. In America, everybody, just about everybody, goes on a government-run health insurance plan at age 65 called Medicare. Um, and you get most of your health insurance from the government. Germany doesn't have a Medicare. People stay with the private insurer all the way. We have a low-cost health care system for uh, poor people called Medicaid. Germany doesn't have Medicaid. People, unemployed people, people with low income are on private insurance and the government subsidizes their coverage. Uh, less government involvement in the United States, and yet this Bismarck system works. And so it's been adopted in a lot of cases, a lot of places. Um, we went to three Bismarck countries for this film because I thought that was probably the model that was most likely for Americans to adopt. So. It's used in Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, Belgium, France to a degree. Japan, as you saw in my book, I call Japan Bismarck on Rice, because they looked around the world and adopted um, the 
the Bismarck model. So here's my question. Is that model, is that German model, is that socialized medicine? No, I'd say no. No, it's more private than ours. Government definitely regulates the insurance companies. Government tells them what they have to cover. It tells them they have to cover everybody. It regulates the premiums, the prices, and um, interestingly, in all the other Bismarck countries with private insurance, no country has this in-network, out-network model that American companies have where the insurance company tells you which doctor you can go to. No. In France and Germany and Switzerland, you pick the doctor, you pick the clinic, you pick the chiropractor, you pick the acupuncturist, and insurance has to pay. And as we said, you generally have to pay within a day or two. Get this, in Switzerland, where we saw in the film, in Switzerland, if the insurance company doesn't pay your claim within five days, next month's premium is free. Anybody here have that deal? Nobody here has that deal. So, the private system, the Bismarck model, can work with some regulation of the insurers and the prices. You wouldn't be honest. Okay. Uh, now, the third model I want to talk to you about is kind of a blend, a marriage of those two. If you remember, in Britain, government provides the care and pays for the care. In Germany, the providers are private and the insurers are private. In the third model, the providers, the docs and hospitals and labs and drug companies are private, but the payer is government, is public. Uh, this is sometimes called the social insurance model. Uh, you can call it the Douglas model after Tommy Douglas, the Canadian who invented it. And the paradigm case of this is Canada. So here's what happened in Canada. In Saskatchewan, which is not too far from, it's not like Minnesota. It's like Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska. It's, it's a Midwestern, conservative, wheat-growing province. Um, in Saskatchewan in 1940, this is, you know, it's, it's Kansas. I mean, this is a pretty Republican conservative farming province. In that province, a uh, far-left, fiery socialist ran for governor. As you know, they call him premier, but a guy named Tommy Douglas, he was a Baptist minister, and just a fiery, outspoken socialist, ran for governor in this conservative Republican state province, and he won. Now, how did he do that? Here's what he did. He promised that everybody in Saskatchewan would have access to health care. This is at a time when about 15% of the province had health insurance, the bankers in Lake City, and that was all. And, and then he set up a system to provide this, and here's the system that he created. Um, under this uh, social, social insurance system, or the Douglas system, everybody is required to pay in every month to a government-run health insurance plan. Everybody has to pay. And then you go to the doctor or hospital for free. There's no bill in most provinces in Canada. And the, the health insurance scheme pays the bill. Uh, everybody's covered. Everybody gets should get decent care. And this really worked in Saskatchewan. Because, you know, in the 1940s, Canada was still struggling to get out of the Depression. For the first time, doctors knew that they would be paid for every patient if they were there. So they moved there and built hospitals. It really worked in Saskatchewan, and so it spread through all of Canada. By 1961, everybody in Canada was covered under a similar scheme. The Canadians don't call it a single-payer scheme because 10 provinces and three territories have their own uh, system. So they call it multi-payer, but it's really a single-payer scheme. There's one for each province. Um, and it turns out to work pretty well. Uh, it doesn't work that well in Canada, however. You've heard these horror stories about uh, about long waiting times and limited choice in Canada. I think they're true. I think uh, in my reporting, uh, it's definitely true that people are kept waiting a long time. I spent some time in, uh, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, with a fabulous family doctor. Just a wonderful guy. He was seeing 45 patients a day, and then after the last patient, he talked to 15 more on the phone. Just really a hardworking, decent guy, and um, and he was he, he liked the fact that anybody in Saskatchewan could walk into his office and get treated, and uh, he he had an office.
shops right across from the university campus. So a lot of his patients were students or you know university administrative professors, you know, upper middle class people. But while I was sitting in his office, this woman came in and she she just she was filthy. You know, she just kind of dressed in rags, dirty. She smelled of urine. She just stank. And, just, and uh, she lived on the street. She was living on a, in a gutter, basically. And uh, she came in and um, she said, uh, uh, yeah, she, she lived on the street because her boyfriend finally threw her off because she wouldn't stop drinking. And what am I going to do? I got no place to live. And, oh, what are you doing here? She says, well, I've been feeling kind of punk. You know, I, I kind of hurt. I kind of got this pain. I just, I just don't feel very really good. And the doctor reaches over and touches her abdomen on the right side. And uh, she recoiled in pain. And instantly, I mean, within seconds, he was on the phone to an ambulance. He says, I think I got an emergency abby here. You better get over here. And then he says to the woman, look, uh, I think you've, you've got a, an infected appendix. We don't want it to burst. We want to treat this right away. I'm going to have an ambulance take you to the hospital. I'm going to cut it out. You don't need this anyway. He says, we're going to cut it out of your body. And the woman now kind of spreads you some ambulance hospital. I got no money. How the hell am I going to pay for that? And he says, no, no, no. You're not going to pay a thing. The ambulance is free. The hospital is free. The care is free. The bed is free. And afterwards, you're going to come see me. And it's free. And, you know, the ambulance came and took her. And then he turned to me and said, this, this is the glory of Canadian medicine. This system really works for that woman. And then I said to him, you know, I got this bum shoulder. It's <laughs> And uh, he palpitates, you know, and, and, uh, and massages and says, yeah, yeah, you've got a real problem there. I, he says, you got to see an orthopedic surgeon. And guess what? There's a guy I went to school with right down the street. Really good. I really recommend him. And it's a gatekeeper system in Canada. So he has to give you a recommendation. He said, I'll, I'll write your recommendation to see Dan, and, and he'll take good care of you. And I said, how long will it take? He said, oh, 10 months. Mm -hmm. 10 months? But I heard every day. I wake up. I, I don't want to wait 10 months for treatment. And he said, oh, I didn't say treatment. No, no, it'd be 10 months for the initial consultation. It'd be weeks after that if you wanted to do anything. So that, this is the problem in Canada. They just don't spend enough money on their system. If you're acutely ill, man, you're, you're fine. But if, you, if, if your problem is that your back hurts or your shoulder hurts or your knee hurts and it can wait, well, then you wait. So I think a lot of these horror stories we hear about Canada are accurate. Um, uh, but it's not the model. The model of public payment for private providers really can work. And it's been adopted in a lot of places, Australia, uh, South Korea, and Taiwan. Taiwan took the Canadian model where everybody pays into a public insurance plan and goes to private doctors. This is a system that works. So, public payment of private providers, would you call this socialized medicine? Uh, Quasi-socialized medicine? Semi-socialized medicine? I think the answer to that question has to be no. No, this cannot be socialized medicine. It absolutely can't be. And, and the answer, this is just a matter of simple logic, and here's why I say this. In 1965, uh, Lyndon Johnson decided, it used to be that elderly people in the United States, um, I'm over 65, am I elderly, that people over 65 couldn't get health insurance. Because the insurance, you know, those people tend to get sick, and they don't, the health insurance don't like other people like that. So they just couldn't get health insurance. And a lot of people lost everything because of a fairly mild, mild minor illness paying the bills. And so in 1965, under President Lyndon Johnson, we established a health insurance plan for seniors, for people over 65. Um, and guess what? They took the model from Canada. You pay into a public insurance scheme, and you go to private doctors, which then pays. Uh, and they took the name from Canada, because the name that Tommy Douglas invented for his system was Medicare. We've always called it Medicare. We took the model and the name from Canada. Today, there are 49 million Americans on Medicare, and it's very popular. It has much higher satisfaction ratings than private insurers. Um, and, and therefore, this is why I say it cannot be socialized medicine, because Americans really like Medicare, and Americans hate socialized medicine. 
that just as a simple matter of logic, this system cannot be socialized medicine. Do you agree with me? Okay. Now, uh, I've given you three models, and those are the three models that we find in rich countries. Maybe 35 of the world's 200 countries have healthcare systems. For most of the countries in the world, healthcare is a luxury. Countries where people make a dollar or two dollars a day, where per capita income is seven hundred and fifty dollars a month, uh, uh, a year. I'm sorry. Uh, they can't, you know, just food and clothing and shelter are tough enough in those countries. In the poor countries of the world, they don't. They generally don't provide health care. A country like, uh, you know, Pakistan, um, Algeria. Uh, there, there will be two or three hospitals in the big cities that you can go to for free. And if you live in the village, you're just out of luck. Half the people in India, that is 700, 650 million people, will never see a doctor in their whole life. Because they just, they just don't, can't provide care. And the name of that model, all economists agree on this, is the out-of-pocket model. It's what it means. If your child is sick and you have some money in your pocket to pay the doctor, she can get treated. If you have no money, she stays sick or she dies. That's it. That's the model in most of the world, the out-of-pocket model. And you don't, you know, if you don't have money, you pay with what you can get. I was in Nepal. I was up in northern Nepal near Lukla, where there are no roads. You, you walk everywhere. And I walked about a, two hours up a fairly steep hill. And on top of this hill was this plain, squat, stucco building. It looked like a shed, you know, a garden shed or something. And um, except all the walls were a different color. I couldn't quite figure that out. And I went inside. That was the local medical clinic. It served about a, about a 100 square mile area. And I was inside talking to the doctor. I said, Gee, do your patients pay you? He said, well, you know, some of them have a little money. Uh, he, he's, he said, you know, they pay me with what they've got. Well, like what? And he said, well, I eat a lot of potatoes. That's the staple crop there. And when people walk to the doctor with their sick child, they carry 10 pounds of potatoes over their shoulder. And he said, sometimes people say, doctor, thank you for treating my mother. I'd really like to pay you. I don't have any money. But you know what? I've got a can of paint at home. I'll come back and paint your clinic. And they all have a different color. And that's what he ends up with. Uh, that's the out-of-pocket model of healthcare. It's the most common model in the world. Uh, so. I found these four models. If you if you're really into this, um, there's much more detail. You you can there's a book about this you could buy if you really uh, wanted to know. Um, and it took me I, I spent about two years doing it for the book, and then while I was writing the book, as I said, I went around the world again to see the same doctors for the movie. So it was pretty expensive. Uh, my publisher Penguin Press sent me around the world, and then. PBS sent me around the world for that Frontline movie. And of course, PBS is funded by viewers like you, so I'm going to give you that ride in the bullet train. Uh, uh, and here's the secret. As I, I said, this in the movie is not that much of a secret. But please don't tell the accountants at Penguin Press this. Guess what? I could have seen all four of the models and never left home. Because right here in the richest country in the world, we've got them all. If you're a veteran, like I am, or Native American, um, and you know those people are in a government-run, government-funded healthcare system, the Veterans Administration, it works exactly like the NHS. I use the Veterans Hospital on 9th Street in Denver. Government-run hospital, the doctors, the nurses, the lab technicians, they're all government employees. You don't get to choose your doctor. You have to wait a little while, but the care is excellent. And you never get a bill. That's the the uh, socialized medicine British system of healthcare right here in the United States. With the VA, active duty military, and the Indian Health Service, there are about 19 million Americans on that system. If you're sharing the cost of private health insurance with your employer, well, you live in Germany for healthcare purposes. 150 million <coughs> Americans. 48 million Americans are on the Bismarck model of healthcare, private insurance paying private providers. If you're over 65 and you're on Medicare, as I said, you live in Canada for healthcare services. Systems, 49 million Americans are using the Tommy Douglas model. 
And if you're one of the 48.6 million Americans without health insurance, um, well, you live in Afghanistan or Algeria or Angola for health care purposes. You know, if you have some money and can pay the doctor, you get treated. If you live in a big city that has a, a free clinic, uh, you can go and get treated. If you're sick enough to go to the emergency room, they have to treat you because we have decided with no other option to put that burden on hospitals and emergency rooms. And any hospital executive in America can tell you instantly how much uncompensated <coughs> care they provided last year. The number is going to be $100 million for a decent sized hospital, $400 million, because we force them to pay. And I don't know, your doctors, do you spend much time in an emergency room? Uh, you're in this hot, crowded waiting room, crying babies, sick elderly people. This is the healthcare system we have provided for 48.6 million Americans. It's the out-of-pocket model right here in the United States. Uh, we've got them all. And this is a fundamental difference between the U.S. and all the other countries we saw, because in the other countries, they've made an active decision to put everybody in the same system. You know, if there are countries that really like government, like Sweden or Norway, um, Britain, they put you in an NHS system, but everybody's in it. Uh, capitalist countries like Germany, Switzerland, Japan, they use the Bismarck model, but everybody uses the same rules and the same forms and the same prices. You saw that big book in Japan where he's looking at the price. The price for the same procedure is the same everywhere in Japan. Um, everybody is treated the same. Everybody has the same access to the same care at the same price. This is really crucial in other countries. And when I went around the world, I asked them, you saw John McCain said, we don't need a one-size-fits-all healthcare system. Everybody's different. We need our overlapping, fragmented system. And so I asked people in other countries, why do you do this? Why would you put everybody in the same healthcare system? gave me several reasons, but the main one is they think it's fairer. They think it's fairer if everybody has the same access to the same care uh, at the same price. Why? Because access to health care is a basic human right. And you heard that in the movie, didn't you? That Swiss president, he's the head of the Christian Democrats in, in Europe, Christian Democrats are the Republicans. They're the low-tax, pro-business party. And the Social Democrats are the, uh, are the Democrats. He's the Republican big business party, and he's the guy on our movie who said, well, why? Health care is a basic human right. As a matter of decency and solidarity, we have to provide health care for everybody. Uh, and that's why it's this, that, that moral obligation, that sense of fairness, that uh, prompts everybody, all the other rich countries, to provide health care for everybody. Um, now, do you think Americans have the same sense of moral obligation? Do you think we feel a need as a decent ethical society to provide health care for all our citizens? Do you think so? But we don't do it. We've never done it. And at the moment, as I said, 48.6 million Americans are um, without health insurance. It's interesting, uh, Americans, many Americans really resist the notion of a right. You know, if you say, don't you think everybody has a right to health care when they're sick? A lot of Americans say, I have too many rights already, damn it. You know, we're already funding too many entitlements. It's just another way to take money out of my pocket for some lazy guy. You get that a lot. A lot of Americans resist the notion that there's a right to health care. But here's the interesting thing. If you say the same thing to Americans in different terms, well, then they buy it. If you say to Americans, and there's polling on this, uh, the Pew Trust polls on this every year. They ask the question, do you think anyone in your community, that's a little vague, but you know, it's vague on purpose, do you think anyone in your community who's sick should have access to a doctor? 96% of Americans suggested that. Of course we think that's right. When our neighbors are sick, we want to give them care. If you said to them, do you think your neighbor who's sick has a right to health care? Now, they don't like that. But we do 
buy the notion that a rich, decent, ethical society should provide health care. And I think that was the fundamental impetus behind Obamacare, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Barack Obama, as you saw in the movie, we made this movie during the 2008 election, said, doggone it, we need to provide health care to every American. And it's, if you look at the exit polling in the 2008 election, why did you vote for Barack Obama? Um, number one was he's going to end the war in Iraq. Number two was he's not George W. Bush. <laughs> and number three was he's going to provide health care for every American. It really drove that election. Americans wanted to do it. And then we ended up with this bill, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. And guess what? It doesn't do it. I don't know how much detail you all know about Obamacare, but the basic goal of Obamacare is to expand coverage. And it's designed to provide health care coverage to 32 million Americans who don't have it today. Uh, right there, you can see the gap. We have 48 million Americans without health insurance. And bill is only designed to get to 32. It's all they could afford under the complicated mechanism they use. But it's better. You know, it's better to get those 32 million people covered. And the way they're going to do it is 16 million of them were designed to be covered by expanding Medicaid. This is the state federal program for low-income people. And 16 million are going to go on private insurance through the state-run exchanges. Um, as it turns out, it's not going to work quite that well. I think there at the moment 18 states are not taking the Medicaid expansion. Um, it looks as if the exchanges won't work quite as well as, as they had hoped. The American Hospital Association now thinks in the first two years, Obamacare will add about 24 million new people to the insurance rolls. That's good. You know, it's better than where we are now, but it doesn't solve the problem. Even if Obamacare works perfectly, when it takes full effect in 2019, 2018, there's still going to be 25 to 30 million people in our country without health insurance. We're still not going to get where all the other countries, rich democracies, have gotten because they feel that moral obligation. So my argument to the vet students here, young people here, is we, we haven't fixed this. It's now your generation that's going to have to come around and get us to the point where we find a way to cover every American. And the argument is, the argument in this film is there are a lot of ways to do it. Medicare for all would definitely work as it, as it does in Australia and Taiwan. Um, Government-run health care would work. We could spend the VA, everybody in America would work fine. Uh, a, a private insurance system, as they have in Germany, would definitely work if we set regulations so they're covered in we definitely could do this. I hope that your generation of young doctors takes this on and gets it done. Um, and, and so here's my main point. I tell you what I do. I know you're busy. You have you know, med students. You ever get any time to sleep? I know you have a lot of stuff going on. You're like, you may not have time to read my book. Um, I mean, you could still buy it. That doesn't take any time. <laughs> uh, so here's what I'll do. I'm going to summarize my book for you in one sentence, and then you don't have to read it. Uh, what I discovered in this movie and in writing the book is, if we Americans could find the political will to cover all our neighbors, if we could find the political will to provide health care for everybody like all these other countries do, if we had the will, the other countries could show us the way. Yeah, so I probably blab too long as usual, but uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have. Again, I want to thank you for taking time on this Saturday. Yes, ma'am. So, question. So, you, you stated that in the U.S., um, CEOs of hospitals will be able to essentially talk about how much. Um, do, do I need to use this? Okay. Uh, um, how much is spent on ER visits that they don't patients, get paid for? Right. Yeah. So we also know that that's an out-of-pocket cost versus an insurance payment. Yeah. So when they're talking about the bottom dollar, are they looking at what they charge 
out of pocket or are they looking at what they charge to an insurance company because there can be a 50% difference. Yeah, that's a, such a good point. Every hospital executive, CEO, any hospital executive will give you a number for how much uncompensated care they provide. As I said, it's 100 million, 200 million, <clears throat> but it's an inflated number. That's your point. This is if they were paid full price for the services they provided, and they never are provided full price. They have a price chart that's totally fictional. Almost nobody pays it. But they take the highest number and multiply that times the number of unpaid visits where they provided that treatment. So actually, the, the, the real cost to them is much lower, but they're still spending a lot of money uh, providing care to uh, people who can't pay. And, um, you know, and, and you've been to emergency rooms. There are people clearly who come into an emergency room sick or shot or injured in a car accident, and they know from the first second they're not going to be paid for the treatment side, but they do it. They do it because they're doctors, they do it because that's their role in life, and they also do it because it's federal law. They have to do it as long as, until that patient is stable. Um, but yeah, you're right, they're overpricing the number because they're using the number based on their price chart, which is a fictional chart. I, think it's uh, I have tried to explain overseas. I was uh, in uh, Europe this spring, shortly after the series ran, a big article ran in Time Magazine by Steve Brill about the huge variation in prices in American hospitals. Same hospital has 18 different prices for the same procedure run by the same team in the same room. I was trying to explain this in Germany, and, and the guy says to me, no, no, I mean, uh, Herr Smith pays a higher price than Herr Jones for the same procedure from the same doctor, yeah, yeah, that's how it works. It wouldn't happen that way in Germany. But you know, why, why do they do that? And I said, well, because Hare White paid nothing for the same procedure, so they have to charge Hare Smith more to make up for what they didn't charge Mr. White. That's really confusing to them. Well, why would he pay nothing? Why didn't the system pay? You, you with me on this? It's a crazy system we've come up with, all built around this concept. Have you learned this in med school, the term the cost shift? You know the cost shift? Uh, they don't get paid enough. Well, they don't get paid anything by the people they treat for free. They don't get paid enough by Medicaid. So what they do is they overcharge people on private insurance. And they shift the cost. Guess what? No other country has a cost shift. Because they have one price, and they're paid for every patient. Uh, I, I gave a speech to the American Hospital Association. I said, you know, uh, how much? Uh, anybody here have uncompensated costs last year over 100 million? Oh yeah, over 200 million. Oh yeah. And you know what? The how much uncompensated care a German hospital provides in one year? Zero. Because they're paid for everybody. They're paid for every diagnosis, every admission, every treatment. They're paid because the system has decided they should be paid, so they don't have to cost you. But they don't have to lie about their uncompensated care numbers because they don't have to. That, to me, is a more sensible way to run the system. Yes, sir. I, I, I did read your book, and thank you for it, because I think it really, really, really helped me a lot. I've been in medicine for a long time. And, and listening to this and watching this, it seems to me the biggest problem is insurance companies. I mean, Germany has regulated insurance companies. We have unregulated insurance yes. company, and this, you know, these four different systems we have, it's the insurance, that's where the problem is. Now, we don't have the right. right. understanding of the political will, but if we had, if we had then it could be the German system, it could be the British system, it could be any system, but this system, the lesion is the insurance companies. I completely agree with that, and the reason that Obamacare could never get to cover everybody it's because they built so much around of it around the private insurance system that we have, and the costs are so high, they couldn't produce enough subsidies to cover it. You know, that's the flaw. It, it, it. But my argument is you, you still could do it with private insurance yeah. if we regulated them the way other countries do. Our insurers have been very successful at resisting regulation, both the federal and state level. And one of the great advances of Obamacare is 
in order to get the exchanges, in order to get their role in the system, the insurance companies did agree to more regulation than they ever accepted before. For one thing, they now have to cover everybody. They can't turn you down because you're 25 and you might get pregnant in the next five years. So, you know, a lot of people like that that you can't buy insurance. They have to cover everybody. Um, they, well, they're still going to be allowed to, uh, to have in-network, out-network, which no other country has. I felt very strongly they should not be allowed to deny claims. I think an insurance company should have to pay any claim certified by a doctor or hospital. They're still going to have the right to deny claims. And they, anybody here had an insurance claim denied? I certainly have. They do it to tens of millions of people every year. Um, at least now they're going to have to report at the end of the year how many claims they, they denied. It's, it's, not, it's not enough. Uh, so they have accepted regulation. They have accepted limitations on their administrative costs, although they're now trying to find ways to get around that. Uh, so with political pressure, I think we could get the insurance companies to accept more regulation to act more like the European or Japanese companies. Work. But I totally agree with you. And then the last point is the question of making a profit on health insurance. Um, all the other countries that have private insurance have decided that they you can't operate health insurance at a profit because there's a basic conflict. If you need to make a profit selling health insurance, the way you do that is by not paying doctor bills. And this is why they have 100,000 people in that industry whose job is to deny clients. This is why they won't cover anybody at the moment who, won't, who might get sick on them. So um, I, I, most of the countries I went to feel that if, if, if the doctor, if the lab, is not, if the hospital is for profit, that you can handle. But they've all decided that there's no place for profit in basic health insurance. Uh, Switzerland was the last one to do that. And we haven't gotten there. So I agree with you. I think that's a fundamental problem. I have I, I, I no question about the Minnesota change. It's, it's quite good. So it's yeah. an interesting thing to see what happens in the state. But they don't have health insurance companies on the exchange board. Ah. I saw, did you see the story on today's Minneapolis paper? The front page story about the prices on the Eminenture, or whatever it's called, Eminenture. Um, they're going to be really low. These prices look great. So I think somebody did design a good exchange. I, I might point out we also had an excellent exchange in Colorado. It's really going to be great. And uh, this is important. I was at HHS this summer. And they now feel they're not going to have 50 good insurance exchanges. Uh, they're not going to have 30 good ex insurance exchanges that work well. They now feel if they can have five or six or eight that work, then they can say to the other states, look, this system could work if you try. Um, if we make it work in Colorado, then HHS can say to Kansas and Nebraska and New Mexico and Utah, hey, Colorado can do it. So look, Wisconsin, they didn't even do an exchange, right? So if Minnesota can make it work, they got to be embarrassed, right? I mean, they're not going to be good at it. <laughs> so that's the idea. So I was very pleased to see that story this morning. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I uh, yes. Can you comment on uh, mental health, behavioral health services, and how they're covered under those four systems, and how they integrate the health care delivery? Uh, all the countries I went to, all the rich countries I went to, uh, treat mental health, behavioral uh, health issues just like a physical problem. There are no limits. The notion that you can only bill so many visits a year or something, that's an American invention. They, nobody makes that distinction. What they do have is many countries have a shortage of mental health professionals, and they're looking for ways to deal with that. But um, in terms of insurance or coverage, it's, it's just like any other one. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, can you hear me up there? I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, uh, earlier you alluded to the IHS, the Indian Health Service. I yeah. was at um, the annual meeting of the Association of American Indian Physicians last month. Um, yeah. Jeremy Lazarus the immediate past president of the American Medical Association actually was there to give a talk. And it had nothing to do with universal health care, but at the end, there was an audience of like three, four hundred people there, mostly Native American. And so 
I decided to ask him the simple question, when is the AMA going to support universal uh. health care? Of course, he was very unhappy with the question. Yeah. He very explicitly stated, we, the United States, the AMA, we do not consider health care universal right. And you have already said, I don't really, I agree with you, I don't really think that is the issue. And so my question to you sort of strategically for the most of us are future physicians in the world, should we be evangelizing the idea of universal health care as, as a basic right? Should we be evangelizing the idea of increased government regulation? What is it that we should really be speaking out for? Uh, I think the crucial thing, is, uh, two points. One is the awareness. Americans don't know that so many people don't have coverage. Um, if you ask the question, Pew, as I said, the Pew Trust asks this question every year. Do you think anyone in your community who's sick should have access to a doctor? 96% of Americans say yes to that. And then if they ask the question, do you think anyone in your community who's sick does have access to a doctor? 90% of Americans say yes to that too. They think we do treat everybody. I think, I've always said if Americans knew how cool our system was, we'd fix it. Uh, that's my view anyway. Um, so I think you need to make the point that a lot of people aren't getting adequate health care at the world's richest country. And, um, and we ought to find a way to cover everybody because what I think is, once you make that commitment, and as I said, it's a moral commitment, this, this is not a matter of, of uh, management or economics. It, it, it's a moral decision. It's an ethical decision. Once you make the commitment to cover everybody, well, then you can find a way to do it, just like the British did, and the French did, and the Japanese did, and the Taiwanese did. Um, we've never made that commitment. Uh, we're living with the system that leaves 48 million people uninsured. I don't know if you know these numbers. The National Academy of Sciences does studies on um, unnecessary deaths in the United States due to illness. And uh, they say about 25,000 Americans die every year of treatable diseases because they couldn't see a doctor. They didn't have the money to see a doctor. And people always say to me, no, that can't be true. That's a baloney statistic. That, that's, we don't allow that in America. Um, on the first page of my book, First page of my book, we meet a 32-year-old college graduate who got lupus. You know, lupus can be a serious disease, but modern medicine knows how to treat it. Uh, she lost her job, she lost her insurance, and she died at age 32 uh, in the richest country in the world because she couldn't afford care. And I went to visit her doctor, and her doctor said, actually, this is in, uh, it's in another movie, yeah. Um, her doctor said to me, she didn't die of lupus. She died of the American health system because it wouldn't provide the care she needed. So this definitely happens. I think if Americans knew that, um, then they would demand that it be fixed. Um, I think Americans do know we have the most expensive system in the world. Um, many Americans are satisfied with their care, and many Americans are satisfied with their insurance. But I think if they knew that others weren't getting kind of care you want to get in a rich country. That's my view. So that's your job, is to get this across to people. Yes, sir. Would you comment on the role of lobbyists from pharmaceutical device companies, other interests in the healthcare industrial complex? Yeah, lobbyists from the uh, health industry. You know, if you consider healthcare a single industry, it's our biggest industry. Um, and uh, Lobbyists have tons of influence because there are tons of money flowing through the American political system. Most other democracies do have limits on how much you can spend on politics. Uh, you just you can't spend $10 million to get elected to the parliament in most countries. And, and therefore, money plays less of a role. In America, money, campaign money is an absolute essential. You can't get elected without it. And you get a lot of that from lobbyists. Yeah, they, they had a huge role in, uh, in the formation of Obamacare. Uh, nobody would have, no economist would have designed Obamacare, but it, it's a function of compromises with interest groups and lobbyists. Yeah, they have tons of power. But, 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 get 
get this, uh, Switzerland has more money flowing through politics on a per capita basis. They have hugely expensive national elections. They have TV advertising in Switzerland like we do. Um, they have huge insurance companies, some of the world's biggest drug companies, all of whom fought the reform that we saw in this film. They all fought it with big money, and the people of Switzerland passed it anyway. Why? Because the advocates like this woman, Ruth Dreyfus, who walked around like Jimmy Lewis, um, made, made it a moral issue. They said, doggone it, we're all living together in this rich country. We have an obligation to provide health care to the least of our brethren. The term that the Republican president of Switzerland used in our movie was solidarity. Solidarity. Uh, Americans talk about liberty, individual liberty, freedom. Most of Western Europe, solidarity, we're all in this together. Community, belonging is a more important term to them than liberty is to Americans. And because of that, they didn't want to leave their fellow Swiss uncovered. So uh, he said an interesting thing. We didn't put it in the movie. I didn't put it in the book. He said, you know, there, there are certain, I, I don't know what you know about Switzerland. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly small country, and it has four different languages. And they worry about this a lot because they're afraid that German-speaking Swiss won't be able to talk to Italian-speaking Swiss. So they have this rule in, in Switzerland that when you go to school, everybody has to learn two of the languages from another region of Switzerland. If you're in, French, if you're in Geneva, French-speaking Switzerland, you have to learn German and Italian. If you're in German-speaking Switzerland, you have to learn French and so they can talk to each other. It's a really important thing. And so he said to me, you know, there's certain basic rights that come with living in our country. Uh, of course, we're going to give you the right to vote. We're going to give you an education. We're going to teach you how to talk to every other Swiss. We're going to give you an education in languages. He said, we're going to provide good rail service. He thought that was an essential element of life in Switzerland with good trains at reasonable places. And we're going to give you health care. That's part of solidarity. You see what I'm getting? It, it's a moral issue for them. And I think one of the problems in the United States, one of the reasons we haven't gotten reform, is so many of our reform efforts have been economic. We can save money if we do this. Or the government's going to go broke, and this is going to add to the deficit, rather than, doggone it, we're a decent, ethical people, and our whole Judeo Christian culture tells us we should care for the least of our brethren. If we don't care for him, that's it. We're not living up to our basic cultural. I think that's the way to win it. I think eventually we're going to do it. I thought, I used to tell my kids that my generation would fix American health care. I now think we, we're not going to get there. So doctors, doctors to be, this is your job. Let's get health care for every American. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Reed. We have uh, a small token of our appreciation oh, for you coming out. We have a thank you card in a frame here that doesn't have a picture in it yet. Yeah. So if you all will use me, yeah. our PNHP, we'd like to get a picture with you out in the uh, oh, atrium and everyone here and everyone here in the audience. Yeah, if anyone would like to do that. I'd, I'd like to do that. I, again, yeah. I thank you for coming out. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. So that's yeah, thanks again. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, we got engraved for you too. Good. <laughs> <laughs>